construction. In the end, Manitoba Highways paid for the construction of the highway portion, and the City of Steinbeck paid for the beautification and landscaping portion. The City of Steinbeck changed from diagonal parking to parallel parking in the late 1970s as discussions around rebuilding Main Street began. Like we still do today, it was a contentious issue as it meant reduced parking stalls in front of the businesses. The years from 1982 to 88, prior to the actual Main Street reconstruction, Hespler Street was upgraded from mostly gravel to a paved road. Lowen Boulevard from a narrow two-lane roadway with ditches on each side to curb and gutter design. And Mackenzie was upgraded to a four-lane street, all to handle the truck traffic. And Elmdale Drive was connected from Reimer to Elm and then to Highway Number 12, all in order to provide alternate traffic routes to the main street. By 1988, the designs were mostly completed, and that spring, Manitoba Highways painted a boulevard down the center of Main Street to indicate where the new boulevard would be and to test how the traffic would flow. The painted lines did little to curb traffic concerns as drivers continued to make U-turns anywhere, and jaywalking continued everywhere but at intersections. Mm -hmm. So the following year, in 1989, the city installed removable curbing purchased from Barkman Concrete called Spikma Curbs and filled it with a couple inches of limestone where the painted boulevards had been the previous year, making a solid center boulevard. At least the U-turns were restricted to the intersections now. A number of years earlier, each merchant on Main Street had bought a set of three Barkman concrete planters through the Downtown Merchants Association and placed them on the sidewalk in the front of their respective storefronts. The concrete flower pots were moved off the sidewalk and onto the center boulevard. In 1989 and 1990, the east end of Main Street from the fire hall to Hirschfeld was constructed from two lane to four lane. This included water and sewer upgrades. That was followed in 91 and 92 with construction of the two lane highway. It was made into a four lane from the intersection of number 12 to just west of Mitchell. 93, 94 was the water and sewer reconstruction on Main Street, including all the connections to existing businesses plus the first block connecting each of the side streets of Elm and Friesen, and Reimer, Lumber, Barkman and Craker. Then in 1995, the west portion of Main Street was reconstructed from number 12 to Reimer Avenue, and in 96, the last portion. The east side of Main Street from Reimer to Craker was completed. While this is a series of events, there was much more to it than what people understand today. Businesses were affected for more than one year, and in some cases for up to four years. Parking was an ongoing issue, and the flow of traffic with both regular and emergency vehicles needed to be maintained at all times. None of this could have taken place without the partners that played a key role on many fronts. Weekly meetings were held to keep every partner in the loop as to what happened next. Partners like the Downtown Merchants Association, individual business owners, Manitoba Highways, Manitoba Hydro, Manitoba Telephone, emergency services, just to name a few. Part of the Main Street reconstruction was the city portion the last landscaping piece. This city hired a landscaping firm that put vision to the design for the project. At the same time that was happening, City Council set in motion a beautification committee chaired by Deputy Mayor Ernie Friesen with councillors Gary Reimer and Wes Reimer, plus community members Jim Neustader and Harry Peters representing the Downtown Merchants Association. This group met to come up with ways to work at the beautification, the cleanup, and provide council with feedback on future green spaces, like today we have in the pocket parks. The newly hired landscape architect, together with the beautification committee, brought new ideas to the design. At intersections, large concrete planters were installed to protect the pedestrian while waiting to cross and eliminating the parking right to the corner. The pedestrian now has only four lanes to cross Main Street instead of the six. The tree pits were built 75% bigger than the current standards of the day as it allowed for bigger trees. The sidewalks were widened and Unistone was installed partially as recognition of Barkman concrete, but also as an alternative surface for the visually impaired. New unique street lights were ordered and the whole center median included a sprinkler system and an 18 inch barrier curb, likely to reduce the jaywalking as, as part of the whole center boulevard. On Main Street, each on each side were ash trees, and each block had a unique ash tree. And so in fall, when they do, when you see the fall colors, each block has its own unique set of coloring. 
And the center median had all basswood trees and shrubs graced uh, at the corner planters. There are many different stories of items found while digging up the old Main Street, from an old Model T body that had been welded shut and had been used to store gasoline in the early days of the first gas pumps, and concrete foundations that nobody knew ever existed, and old wells that needed to be sealed. The Minister of Highways at that time was Albert Drieger from Grunfall. Working through Minister Drieger, it was approved that the City of Steinbeck was allowed to tender, reconstruct, and oversee the complete reconstruction project of a major Manitoba highway. It was quite a novel and unique approach, and it was the first time that it happened in Manitoba. But the credit goes to many council and community and business leaders who first had the vision, then were able to sell this project over the many years of planning, then the seven years it took to complete construction. During that time, Steinbeck had three mayors, including Mayors Helmut Pankratz, Ernie Friesen, and Wes Reimer. But the partnerships developed during those years between Manitoba Highways, downtown business, city admin and engineering, construction companies, and the community at large were all critical to the success of that project. And today, many of those relationships are still in place because of it. Today, many have forgotten what it took to complete the project, and few of our history books will actually ever tell the whole story. Now, 22 years later, we continue to have one of the most beautiful main streets anywhere because individuals had a long-term vision for our community. Thank you, you Councillor Siemens. Obviously, it does take partnerships to make those things happen, and I appreciate you uh, telling the story. Uh, uh, certainly, you had a hand in, in that as well, as you actually worked for the city at the time, yeah. uh, part of that time. All right, Council, we do have the agenda in front of us. There's one change, and that is 9F, and that's in regards to a plebiscite, a cannabis plebiscite. Uh, I'll get you to add that to the agenda, please. We will now have, can I have a motion, please, for the adoption of the amended agenda? Councilor Swagstrom, moved by Councilor Penner, seconded by Councilor Penner. Any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. We have the minutes arising from July 3rd on page one. You've had a chance to review those minutes. Can I have someone move, those, uh, move the acceptance, please? Councillor Penner, seconded by Councillor Funk. Any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? There's no business arising from the minutes. We will now move to our public hearing portion, and there are three separate public hearings that we're going to uh, be going through, so I'm going to close the council meeting, open the public hearing. First public hearing is in regards to regards to V 2018-14. This is Woodhaven Avenue. This is on page four for council. Mr. Workentine, I'll ask you to introduce this, please. Uh, yes, this is an application for variance file V-2018-14 for property with a civic address of 185 Woodhaven Avenue. The uh, owners uh, of the property are Rest Haven Nursing Home of Steinbeck, Inc., with the applicant being Chantal Allery of FT3 Architecture Landscape Interior Design. Purpose of the application is to allow a parking aisle width of 20 feet, where a minimum parking aisle width of 25 feet are required. Uh, the applicant is proposing to uh, renovate and also add an addition onto the existing uh, nursing home. And the application for the parking aisle width variance pertains to uh, the staff parking that is provided uh, on the sketch on page 20, sorry, on page 11 of Council's information packages. Notices pursuant to the Planning Act have been issued. There are no written correspondence on file. Uh, with respect to the application, uh, this uh, reduction uh, does create uh, a change in the physical geometry of the vehicle movements. Uh, however, so long as uh, the uh, particular configuration is dealt with at time of uh, site plan uh, review, uh, and, uh, and design, uh, it uh, appears that uh, the owner should be able to uh, address the, uh, uh, the physical geometry of the uh, reduced parking aisle width uh, with respect to the application recommendation from administration uh, is for council to approve the uh, variance. Thank you. Is there anyone here wishing to, our, first of all, is the applicant here today? Thank you. Is there anyone here wishing to object or have any questions to this variation? Okay, please take the podium and state your name and address. Hi, uh, Tim McAllister. I live on 121 Giesbrecht Street. Okay, thank you. I just have a question, um, if we could see the design. Okay. Do, uh, is, there, is there anything specific that we have on this, that we can put on the screen at this time? Yes, just one moment. 
the area highlighted in yellow uh, is the intended area that is subject to the variance. Thank you. Second question, would this variance application affect the uh, variance application V2018-05 at all? No. no. Uh, that was a question for the, uh, for the applicant. Okay. Mr. Warkentine, does this affect any other variation? Uh, this, uh, the request is uh, particular to the specifics as listed okay. only. Does the design change in any way? This is a question for the applicant uh, in relation to variation 2018-05. That will wait for the applicant then. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, was the applicant aware of this requirement when variation 2018-05 was applied for a few months ago? All right. Anything further? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Okay, yeah, please take the podium, state your name and address. Uh, my name is Margaret Miller. I live on First Street, on 45 First Street. And to me, I just don't feel happy with, to have that big building right beside my yard there. So I don't feel comfortable with that. The building is too big for the street and for, for everything there. So. Very and good. I'm going to say thanks for uh, Teresa and James for supporting me so far. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions on this file? Seeing none, does the applicant wish to speak? Does the applicant wish to speak to the, this file? Yeah. Seeing none. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Okay. Please take your... Take the podium, state your name and address. Or we already know your name and address, yeah. right? Yeah. You know this drill anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. So, you can speak only to the chair, please. The applicant won't answer my questions? Uh, the applicant has a choice whether they'd like to speak or not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's disappointing. I will just say that. Um, I thought this is a forum to talk about this stuff in regards to this variance. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes. Yes, you can. You can please take the podium and state your name and address. Chantal Ellery, my home address. Sure. 266 Dubulet in Winnipeg. Thank you. Um, sorry, I, I didn't quite. Uh, I'll get you to only direct, sorry? The, direct uh, your comments towards the chair. I understand the question, but I, I think what he was asking is whether um, this variance was applied for. Uh, in the previous variance? I believe, I, That's, sorry. sorry, the question was uh, specifically was the variation known about at that time or, and does this affect the uh, design that was presented at that time? It was known at that time and was um, missed, so hence the reapplication. Second application. Second. Correct. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else you would wish to add uh, in regards to the variation? Very good. Are there any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing, open the council meeting. Council, how would you like to proceed? Councillor Swagstra. I'll make the motion that we approve the variance. All right, thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Fair, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have uh, an application here to allow, in this particular section, parking aisle width of 20 feet. Uh, where we have a usual minimum requirement of 25 feet. Uh, just a couple things to note. First of all, uh, there, there are other cases in Steinbeck where we have 20-foot uh, parking uh, stalls. Walmart would be one example. 20-foot uh, parking stalls are also quite common in Winnipeg. But most notably in this case, we're not even talking about a parking lot that the public would be using. This is specifically as noted here for staff parking only. So really the reason for the variance is so that uh, Rest Haven, when it does its expansion, has adequate parking for its staff. We want this project to go ahead. It's, uh, it's important for the city. And uh, uh, this is a relatively minor variation that just simply allows adequate staff parking uh, for this expanded facility. Thank you. That's the fair. Nothing further? Any further from Council? Seeing none, call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. We will now move to 6B, that's bylaw 2099. This is the official community plan, second reading. Uh, we're going to have this 
uh, public hearing. Uh, it's going to be for the official community plan first, and then the zoning bylaw will be after that. And so we're first going to address bylaw 2099, the official community plan, and this is second reading. On page 13 of Council's package, close the Council meeting, open the public hearing. Mr. Workentine, I'll ask you to introduce this, and then we will go from there. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor and members of Council, uh, there uh, has been a significant discussion with respect to uh, both the City's official community plan and zoning bylaw, which are the subject of uh, the public hearing. I'll focus on the official community plan bylaw 2099 <coughs> presently. Uh, this uh, update, um, while required by the province of Manitoba to occur uh, at least every five years, uh, the uh, last review that the city completed of its official community plan uh, was in 2015 uh, due to the annexation of lands uh, recently approved from the uh, arm of Hanover uh, the city has uh, undertaken to review its land use and planning policies again due to the uh, significant uh, uh, area of land that was added to city boundaries um, with respect to uh, public consultation uh, in respect to uh, the bylaw um, the city has uh, held open houses with respect to this document, uh, allowing the public to provide comment and ask questions. Uh, it has been presented to uh, meetings of council, including the Strategic Priorities Committee meetings of March 27th, uh, to further identify opportunities in the proposed plan. Uh, and uh, the bylaw was presented for first reading in May of this year. Uh, there are a summary of uh, key changes uh, that have been reviewed, but uh, I'll briefly refer to them again. It's found on page 14 of your information package. Um, Section 2.7, Development Reserve. Uh, there has been uh, a renaming of uh, Development Reserve due to the addition of Annex Lands, uh, with the intent and policies generally remaining the same. Section 2.8 refers to a Development Reserve 2. There was an additional category of Development Reserve that was added, uh, by and large, for the Annex Land uh, in the rural areas uh, as a way of uh, identifying particular policies uh, that would, by and large, permit the traditional agricultural capacity of those lands to continue, uh, subject to, again, a review of city policies to make sure that the policies would align. Uh, section 3.2 pertains to PTH 12 and PTH 2 Highway Access Management Transportation Plan. Uh, this addition was included as a reference uh, in uh, the official community plan uh, as a result of this study being completed uh, uh, earlier in 2017. Section 3.3.1 to 3.3.3 uh, includes policies to permit uh, repair or replacement of existing on-site water management systems or septic fields uh, only within the Development Reserve 2 designation. Uh, sections 4 and 5 uh, refers to the land use uh, and reference maps. Uh, it does uh, identify uh, key uh, provisions within the document uh, in a visual format to allow greater understanding of the policies that, uh, that have been uh, listed. Um, based on the overall review, uh, input that uh, the City has received from the public to date uh, and uh, the, uh, the background information provided, uh, recommendation from administration that uh, subject to any information that may be provided at the public hearing, uh, that City Council give bylaw 2099, the official community plan, second reading and then can be submitted to the Minister for approval. Thank you. We do also have Lacey Godet here, who is the City Planner for the City of Steinbeck. Uh, we're now uh, opening it up to any questions in regards to the official community plan portion, uh, and that's bylaw 2099. Does anyone here have any questions? Yeah, please take the podium, state your name and address. I have a feeling I'm gonna lose my voice today. My name is Teresa Burgess. I live at 56 Donald Avenue with my husband Jamie and our daughter Laura. You've presented a community plan that represents vision of the current council for the future of the city of Steinbach and we applaud your efforts. This is a huge undertaking. Laying out the game plan for the city for the next 5, 10, 20 years and beyond. This is the game plan that at least three of you will not be implementing which is one of the reasons we object to it being given second reading today. With an election only three months away, we feel it would be prudent to have this plan voted in by the new council who can provide their stamp of approval on the rules of engagement that they will need to operate under. 
In your summary and vision, you indicate the importance of planning for parks and green space. Could we see the map? Use? We will. Just I'll let you finish your presentation and we'll bring up the map. Yeah. Um, if you look on the map, there appears to be a very large void of green space zoning south of Lowen Boulevard and east of Geesbrecht. The lack of designated park and green space policy area needs to be addressed as you're promoting, quote, importance of larger outdoor spaces, unquote, and the increase of residential density in the downtown. You need space for people to get outside. And that would be in reference to your central business district appearance and vitality on <clears throat> page 20. In your summary and vision, you refer to affordability and inclusive community. Can you define this and explain this? Your statistics talk about population and age and how many homes or houses you will need. Does this address the significant need for seniors, homeless, and families that fall into that low income category? Stats Canada defining this as a single person earning less than $22,133 a year or a family of four that earns $44,266 per year. And what about those living below the poverty line? Where is the aspect of this demographic identified and addressed in your plan? And have you considered the impact of the tiny house trend and how that would fit into our community as a solution to affordable housing? Have you identified a definition for affordable? Your document indicates that one should consult the community plan to determine land use. So if I look at the space where Barkman Concrete is on your community plan use map, we see that a large portion of it is residential policy area. According to the zoning bylaw, this is zoned light industrial, which would be appropriate, but is not allowed in a residential policy area. Which is it? Industrial policy area or residential policy area? Section 68 of the Planning Act requires there to be consistent between the consistency between the two documents. Are there other consistencies? Our primary concern is on transitional zones. By your definition, a transitional zone district is designed to provide transition between commercial concentrations and predominantly residential areas, where residential and low-impact commercial activities can coexist. Development within this area is to retain current built forms and lot configurations. You have the north side of First Street, west of Brant, and east of Geesbrecht, indicated as Central Business District Transitional Policy Area. You already have transition into this area at the Brant End with Century 21 Golden West. Low impact commercial, medium density residential, and it has garage units that offer a great buffer to the residents to the west. To the north, you have the 20 West Building, main floor low impact commercial with medium density housing on the upper two floors. Two doors down, you have another medium density Three story. There is no need to zone First Street beyond Century 21 as a transition. In addition to the fact that there is already transition in existence, there is an issue of lot sizes and zoning. With the exception of one lot on the north side that is already zoned residential medium density, the remainder of lots between Century 21 building and Giesbrecht are currently zoned as residential low density. Of these 15 lots, nine cannot be rezoned to RMD for higher density housing as they do not meet the minimum lot requ width requirements. Of these, five are not conforming in that they do not meet their current zoning of residential low density and can only ever be single family. Changing these lots would be inconsistent with your transitional zone requirement to not change current building lot forms and configurations. Further, the Provincial Planning Act Section 90.1 prohibits the intensification of non-conforming lots, and 199.2 of your zoning bylaw indicates that these pods may not be used to increase density. In this 15-lot section, you have three lots that contain newer homes, four more that contain well-maintained homes, the owners of which have no intention of relocating or living in an area that has this type of transition. Changing the nature of this portion of First Street will have a significant impact on not only the residents on the south side of First, but also impact the entire neighborhood from First Street to Giesbrecht and back to Ellis. 
the transitional zone designation of the north side of First Street, west of Brant, west of Century 21, needs to be changed to residential policy area. With respect to your central business district, you want to create a vibrant downtown. We applaud you with increased residential and mixed use. Here's a thought or two. Move the arena. Don't everybody gasp at once. Move it to the north portion of the land Mel Lone donated to the community on the south side of the golf course, next to the primary care center. This will allow you to build a state-of-the-art multiplex in an area where there is ample parking for people who are using the arena, traveling by car because they're hauling equipment, or in from out of town for tournaments. A larger facility will allow the city to attract larger tournaments, concerts, and events, perhaps even a cultural arts center. This will free up prime area of the downtown for parking, perhaps a hotel, new retail. Second idea. You have two large car dealerships on Main Street taking up prime real estate. Consider taking a page out of the city of Winnipeg's book and create an auto mall on the outskirts of town where you have multiple dealerships in one location. Imagine for a moment what you could do with that space freed up downtown. Two, perhaps three high density apartment office buildings with street front stores and cafes. More people, more foot traffic than two auto dealerships could ever provide. Case in point, Mazda and Panachev used to be downtown. What's there now? Many new businesses have replaced those two alone. The feed mill, I don't think I need to say too much more on that. It's sandwiched between a park that sees lots of kids and pedestrian traffic on the main street and has lots of high, high volume truck traffic. In closing, we strongly object to the transitional zone designation on the north side of First Street, west of the Century 21, and further object to the current zone, sorry, the current community plan being given second reading until new council is in place and can address some of the concerns we outlined and use this plan as their game plan for the future. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting ideas. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodette, uh, if you can uh, just, uh, actually Mr. Workendine, I'll ask you to clarify. Uh, we do have an uh, official community plan in place. There haven't been any changes in, or very few changes, if any changes, in the general uh, older, well, the existing uh, areas of the city, but it, this is a document that is basically uh, addressing the areas that have been annexed. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, very few, if any, changes in the original city of Steinbeck boundaries. Uh, the vast majority, if not all, the changes affect only the newly annexed lands. So uh, the all the uh, varying uh, topics that were discussed by Ms. Burgess uh, are actually in the old uh, official community plan already, and uh, the ones that are be that we are changing or uh, putting into this plan have to do with the new annexed areas. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object or have any f have any questions? State your name and your address. Uh, Mike Reimer, uh, 40032 uh, Road 33 East, um, northwest of Steinbeck. Um, my name is Mike Reimer. I own a mixed farm with my uh, brother-in-law and my dad. I am here today on behalf of, obviously, our farm, but I'm actually here today on behalf of the Manitoba Turkey Board, um, representing turkey farmers and farmers in general regarding the, the annexed land that is, that is called Reserve 2, is that right? In the, in the, um, I, I can't picture exactly where you are, but I would imagine we can reference whether it's Reserve 1 or Reserve 2. It'll be Reserve one of the two. Reserve 2, it's, uh, it's northwest of Steinbeck towards the, the, your, yes, all the orange, um, to the northwest of Steinbeck. And that includes you there somewhere? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm further up on that map, um, but I'll, I'll get into that. Okay. So I'm aware that cities and towns need to grow, and um, I'm very concerned about the city of Steinbeck's annexation and land use proposal as it is currently set out. The acres that are currently designated for the development in Reserve 2 on the map 
is some of the most productive farmland in Manitoba, and as the city of Steinbeck grows, council needs to remember that this community and neighboring communities are where, are where they are today largely due to the agriculture around it. I cannot stress enough that the land that we are building the city on here is producing the food that we're all eating as well. Um, we need to preserve it to the best of our abilities. With the cost of infrastructure only going up and with wages for the most part not keeping up with dwelling costs, we need more, afford more affordable ho housing. The most affordable and economical housing to build is to build up. The only way that I see the city of Steinbeck getting what they want and farmers hanging on to their land as long as possible is if the city starts to focus on building up and not out. Um, now I'm going to be referring to the to the that whole document on page seven under dwellings from the census information that in the community plan in 2011 five or more story f five or higher story apartments was five percent of the new dwellings that were de that were developed in 2016 only four percent of the new dwellings were five story and higher um, that is clearly not what I'm talking about. We need to be going, going higher, um, preserving that land on the perimeters. Um, on page 14, under the infill development, this policy is very vague in my mind. Um, 2.1.1 um, reads, the infill of new housing on vacant residential lands shall be encouraged. Infill should be encouraged is not a policy. We need to make sure that we're building and filling in inside before we're expanding out to some of those perimeters and creating lots of complaints that will be coming all back here about what a farmer did because of a new development that gets set outside of Steinbeck. Um, and it was touched on earlier by someone speaking here, after any one of you or all of you are no longer here and the city is being served by other people, who says there's not different agendas that are going to come up? Personal agendas, we're all affected by our personal um, ideas that will, if we don't have it in the policy today, we may get leapfrogging happening down the road. If we don't put it in the policy today to stop it when we have the chance, I'm afraid that we won't be able to do it once it starts. Um, and one example of this is when you go into 2.1.2, .2, which reads, the subdivision of existing lots to permit an increase in residential will be considered. Um, my question is, let's say, let's just go completely ridiculous in the farthest orange portion away from Steinbeck right now. And I think I'm talking about that and I think that is the city of Steinbeck's lagoon, but let's say the lagoon wasn't there. <laughs> I don't think anyone's <laughs> building there. If someone proposes a uh, subdivision set out all there, all the way out there. Is there anything really that's going to stop it in the community plan? It says in the community plan it will be considered. If we truly are trying to protect the farmland as long as what we can, it shouldn't even be considered if it's a mile out, even though it is in the annexation and it is the city of Steinbeck. Um, so then I'm going to skip through all the way to page 29 under the livestock operations and keeping of animals. So he here's where I have some questions. I want clarity on this. Is a producer with animal units still allowed to spread 
animal waste in the reserve to uh, in the in the zone reserve to land that has been annexed. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the answer, I believe, is yes. So. Yes. Okay. My I'll, next. I'll get clarification, but yes. Okay. Then the next follow-up question to that is: Does a farmer need that in writing? And I'll give you the example. When there's a producer spreading manure over there, you get this crew to come in. You got two million dollars of equipment all showing up. Sometimes at eight, nine o'clock at night, they're all set up. Someone makes a phone call and complains because you guys all work in the evening, so you receive phone calls in the evening. I know that. Um, can we get shut down if we don't have the paperwork? That's a follow-up question. If we are allowed to haul in there, do we do producers need signed documentation from the city of Steinbach, be it once a year, be it once every five years, be it until you guys tell us different? Okay? That's my second question. Um, is there any required length of notice that the city must give before they can stop a producer from spreading on the reserve to land? Um, and then, and then I'm going now, I'm, I'm going down a path, hopefully for me, it's only in 30 and 40 years, hopefully for you guys it's in 10. Um, <laughs> is there any length of notice that the city must give to a producer before that producer will be forced to shut their doors because it is getting too close to where Steinbeck is growing? And here my example is, and I'm looking around, we got a wide range of ages, so I, I have the example. Um, I can kind of pick on John because, you know, I do business with him, but if I'm 60 years old and I'm 10 years away from retiring, all I want to do is just, I just want to finish with farming. Will I be forced to shut the door? I might be shutting the door in 10 years anyways, but it's one thing if I shut the door on my own terms, it's another thing if the city comes and tells me you're forced to shut down. The second scenario to that is if I'm 60 years old and I got a 30 year old son that wants to take over, does he buy the farm? Does he not? Um, all those questions are, they're nowhere addressed in the community plan. And I just think now is the time to be, to be. You're answering, asking the questions, we'll have an answer for you. Yeah. Any other questions? That's everything. That's it. I just want to assure you, most of us grew up on the farm. Most of us. Half of us. I know. I know. So we, we get what you're asking. Uh, we get there's some fear in regards to farming and city. And let me assure you that everyone around this table and anyone in the future will understand clearly how important ag agriculture is to us. So I just want to preface that before we get some answers from administration. I'm going to thank you very much. Any other questions? That is it. For now. for now. Okay, I'll get you to stay right there and we're going to, uh, I'm going to switch this up a little bit because we need to get through this and I want you to be satisfied with the answers. Okay. Uh, or, or at least understand the answers, not necessarily, we may not satisfy you, it's up to, up to you. First of all, uh, farmland use, uh, to administration, uh, farmland use in uh, uh, Development Reserve 1 or Development Reserve 2, can it continue and can the city stop it from, from happening other than Whatever is happening there now, can it be stopped? Uh, under current uh, Planning Act uh, and land use policies, uh, the existing farm practices that are there today are permitted to continue. Second follow-up, uh, any animal units or uh, spreading of animal units on uh, those lands, are, do they require uh, only to, uh, they only require to be uh, following provincial guidelines, is that correct? That is correct. We have no uh, jurisdiction over whether they can or cannot do that. It is simply a provincial. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Does that answer that? That answers that. All right. And then finally, leapfrogging. There is a question in regards to leapfrogging and, and, and uh, development in areas that aren't connected to the city. Uh, Mr. Warkentine or Ms. Godet, can you answer very clearly and concisely how we deal with that? Uh, 
Uh, with respect to uh, the leapfrogging question that, uh, that you had, uh, you referred to one of the policies that the city has within its residential uh, section of the uh, development plan. I believe it was uh, 2.1.1. Yep. Uh, while the uh, policy statements uh, are general, they relate only to land use designations that are in fact residential. As development reserve two, which is the, uh, the, darker, uh, the darker yellow or orange, whatever that color is, uh, that is a separate uh, cat land use category. Okay. Uh, there are separate policies related to that. Uh, further, as a matter of uh, overall policy of development within the city, uh, all development is required to provide uh, full urban servicing with respect to city standards, which includes uh, public sewer, public water, and developed roadways. Uh, it would be uh, enormously cost prohibitive uh, for anyone to even propose that kind of development, uh, nor would the city approve that kind of leapfrog development to proceed. All right. And one, there was one final question, or maybe more of a statement, and I, I get some, maybe get uh, Ms. Godet to clarify in regards to uh, infill and increased density. Our policies are generally some of the most aggressive in rural Manitoba in regards to uh, increased density. Is that correct, especially in the uh, central di business district? Yes, in terms of infill and um, building up, we have had we have infill policies to encourage that for a reason to add density to our existing neighborhoods, and we have had um, in the and, and less than ten years we've had almost a hundred new residential units developed within our existing neighborhoods. So we are promoting what we can for infill development into existing neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. May not fully answer your question, but it just gives you some some insight uh, that we are aware of that uh, so thank you does that answer some of your questions uh, I, I was paraphrasing your question so you maybe I have to that's, you're better at that than I am so that's good um, underlying I'm gonna sum my last two or three questions all up and I'll just get clarification on it 10 20 30 years down the road producer is in the reserve two, it gets changed. It essentially, the city can, at that point, once it's changed to residential or commercial or whatever, they can shut down the farm, basic. No. Am I correct, Mr. Wargantin? You cannot, we cannot shut the farms down that are existing. Current land uses are permitted to continue. Thank you. And that is in that's in that community plan, right? That's in the Planning Act, is that correct? Uh, that is the source of the city's authority to develop its uh, official community plan, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for... Do you have a question for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, Mr. Ram? I have a question or a comment, actually. Uh, uh, I, think, I think, yeah, Fabi, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think one of the things that uh, that uh, is probably not written is that you may not be able to expand there after the growth would happen to your farm, but you're able to you're you're able to continue to grow at the uh, you know to farm at the level you are. It is actually in there that once you're in reserve one, you are you are not allowed to expand, but it doesn't say that you will be shut down but you're not allowed to expand. I'm well aware of that, and I'm not here arguing that. Um, so, so. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me and. Continue farming. I will try. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object? I know Ms. Burgess also had a, had a question, and we want to get back to maybe some clarification for you. Clarification? Sure, please take the podium. You've indicated that this is an amendment to the city plan. If the city plan has to be done once every five years, um, when was the last city plan? 2015? The official community plan, I yes. believe, was 2015, approximately. Okay. So then, if this is only an amendment, are we going to be spending significant time, energy, and our taxpayer dollars having to do a new community plan because that is required within five years, or should we be spending the time now to make this our new plan and address all of the issues as opposed to just the ones relating to the annexation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
please state your name and address. Amy Burgess, 56 <laughs> A Couple questions on the amendment. The bylaw notification doesn't say an amendment to the bylaw. It says to introduce the new bylaw. So my understanding, everything in this bylaw or the community plan is up for negotiation for the planning act. It's a new document for your comment where you said, has anything else changed? So just, just want to make that point. To me, it's a whole new document that can be open to subject to anything. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone further wishing to object or have any questions? Anyone wishing to object or have any questions? All right. We have yes. Mr. Walker, please take the podium and state your name and address. Thank you very much. My name is Stephen Walker. I'm the regional manager for community and regional planning with the province of Manitoba. I'm in the office across the street, 240 at 323 Main Street. Very good. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I also wanted to commend you for the work and the planning that you've done. I think your opening address uh, uh, exemplified the planning that uh, the City of Steinbach is committed to and has been doing. Um, so I, we wish to thank Council, Administration and their consultants for working with the province in reviewing your official community plan. A review of the bylaw is now complete and a summary of the comments um, um, I'm providing to you. Uh, we've also attached uh, documents to our presentation for your further review. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, briefly discussing climate change. Uh, the International Institute of Sustainable Development recently completed a report on local climate change adaptation <coughs> planning in Manitoba. Your existing OCP was reviewed as part of the report and several areas were identified where information and policy in the OCP could be augmented and strengthened with regards to climate change adaptation. The report also reviewed the City of Steinbeck Emergency Plan and can be provided to Council upon request. I believe I have provided a copy to administration, but I can do that again if uh, required. Community and regional planning note that all of the municipalities in southeastern Manitoba, with the exception of Piney, the town of St. Anne, and the City of Steinbeck, have a baseline inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. We encourage the City of Winnipeg, or sorry, the City of Steinbeck, to prepare a baseline inventory of GHG emissions and set out policies and requirements through the OCP and zoning bylaw to reduce emissions. The population growth of Steinbach may significantly increase greenhouse gas emissions from increased transportation and natural gas consumption. Land use planning through the official community plan policies have the potential to create opportunities to reduce emissions through planning for such things as transit and active transportation, as two examples. Uh, similarly, land use policies and development standards in the OCP and zoning bylaw can assist the city to adapt to a changing climate. For example, policies related to how the city of Steinbach will prepare for times of drought and extreme heat could be incorporated in the official community plan. Associated development standards with regards to water consumption or increased landscaping standards and or tree preservation uh, could be incorporated into your zoning bylaw. Community and regional planning have published two planning resource guides related to mitigation and adaptation planning and FCM has a program to assist municipalities in baselines and adapting to climate change. The second area I'd like to address briefly is uh, with regards to environmental policies. Objective C in section 3.3 encourages the use of brownfield sites for infill development. However, uh, we weren't able to find relevant policies for brownfield redevelopment. Community regional planning suggests to include a definition of brownfield sites and policies that provide guidance for brownfield re redevelopment should one occur. Policy 1.3.1 of the PLUPS can be considered as a reference. Uh, relevant policies may require a concept plan and or environmental evaluation or impact study for any redevelopment project on previously contaminated sites. I have a few points to make on agriculture. Um, I'm, I am summarizing uh, all of the points that I have received from the various different departments, so I do apologize if this uh, takes a, a couple of minutes. Um, agriculture and development reserve. Uh, community and regional planning commends the policies in your plan to protect large parcels of land for future urban development from being fragmented by limiting the subdivision of land in Development Reserve Area 1 and 2, 
However, there are no criteria to allow subdivision for existing uses or guidance on boundary adjustments where no additional titles are created. The OCP could be strengthened by including criteria when subdivision may be permissible and under what circumstances. As written, these policies may be interpreted that any subdivision application would require a redesignation in order to be considered. Second, CRP recommends Development Reserve 2 be renamed to Agricultural Area or Limited Agricultural Area to better reflect the intended use of these lands and to minimize the impacts of separation distance requirements from a designated area. For example, land containing the Municipal Lagoon should not be considered a designated Development Reserve and should not be used for the purpose of determining separation distances between livestock operations in Steinbeck or Hanover and a designated area for development. Also, due to the agricultural nature of these lands, a policy should be included in this section of the plan that explicitly states development reserve two area should not be considered a designated area when calculating livestock operation distances in Steinbeck and Hanover zoning bylaws. In Section 3.1, some clarity is required around Development Reserve 2 lands and if they can be redesignated for development. We recommend adding a policy stating Council will not consider the redesignation of Development Reserve 2 lands for the life of this bylaw. This would provide some assurance to the producers as to the time frame that they can continue to operate. Finally, the designation of land in Southwest 176E for residential purposes will impact a hog operation in Northeast 176E in the RM of Hanover. Designating this land for residential development creates higher separation distance requirements for the hog operation if they choose to expand. The lagoon for the hog operation is approximately 2,300 feet from the residential designation. Depending on the size of the hog operation, the residential designation uh, that is being proposed may make the livestock operation non-compliant with the RM of Hanover zoning bylaw. CRP recommends verifying the size of the livestock operation and ensuring the livestock operator is in compliance with the zoning bylaws for the RM of Hanover. With regards to transportation, your official community plan anticipates Steinbach popula Steinbach's population will grow to a population of 25,000 in the next 10 years. Community and regional planning would like to commend Steinbach for their work on planning and building an active transportation network as detailed in reference map 3 of the OCP. This will serve the current and future residents of Steinbach very well. However, the province raises concerns about active transportation facilities located on provincial highways and encourages Steinbeck to build active transportation infrastructure and dedicated facilities that are physically separated from the highway. Community and regional planning recommends that Steinbeck begin planning for a transit system now and incorporate design considerations uh, for a transit system. Beginning to plan for transit today would position Steinbeck very well in the future and could potentially save money on the cost of infrastructure improvements and on property acquisitions. Through the official community plan and other planning tools, Steinbach should begin to plan future development to be transit supportive. For your reference, planning and transportation options and transit policies are listed in section 7.2 of the provincial land use policies. Um, there is a transportation objective and policy um, 3.2.1 uh, that needs to be revised to mention the access management plan that has been negotiated with the Department of Infrastructure. Um, policy 7.2, or sorry, 2.7.2 uh, should be clarified by adding that future development in Development Reserve 1, adjacent to 52, should include plans for an internal road system that again complies with the access management plans that you have negotiated with Manitoba Infrastructure. Um, finally, the newly constructed intersection at the North City boundary on PTH 12 is shown as a strategic intersection on your road classification map and it should be a signalized intersection now. I don't think the signals are actually operating yet, but they are up and uh, almost uh, operational. With regards to historic resources, uh, the historic resources branch has suggested additional policy language for heritage resources and uh, definitions that can be included in your plan. 
They also encouraged the formation of a Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, and we've attached their comments for further reference. Finally, solid waste. Uh, Council may want to consider incorporating relevant planning policies in the official community plan with regards to land use planning for a new landfill site. Steinbach's growth strategy indicates that the current landfill site that serves Steinbach and three other adjacent municipalities will likely reach its capacity and be decommissioned by the end of 2036. The city should begin to explore opportunities with neighboring municipalities to establish a new regional land site, landfill site. Um, the, there's also uh, solid waste policies on page 37 and 38 indicate a reference map 4, which I believe is a, a small error in your uh, plan. Overall, bylaw 2099 is generally consistent with the provincial planning regulation. Community regional planning recommend the above planning matters be considered and addressed if deemed necessary before the OCP is given second reading as per the Planning Act. After Council has given second reading, please submit the bylaw to Community Regional Planning in Steinbach for the approval uh, from the Minister of Municipal Relations as per the Planning Act. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have Ms. Goodette uh, uh, come to the podium and uh, she will have just a few uh, responses in regards to uh, some of the uh, things addressed. Ms. Goodette. Um, administration has reviewed the comments that have been provided by Community and Regional Planning. Um, there are some comments that were provided that um, are not, um, that I can answer. So in terms of uh, environmental policies um, for brownfield sites, the city has a very limited number of brownfield sites in existence within the city. Um, they're isolated properties. So the need for further policy is not necessarily not necessary. Um, the ones that are in existence, um, some are in the process of being developed or in the process of being remediated. Um, prior to any development that would be allowed on any of those brownfield sites, there would be uh, development agreements put in place and concept plans, which is similar to development of any lots within the city. Um, in terms of agriculture and development reserve, um, there are no uh, livestock operations within the newly annexed area within the city. There are um, some properties with the keeping of animals, but we don't have any livestock operations, and new livestock operations won't be permitted. Um, there's reference to a property within the arm of Hanover regarding a hog operation. That operation has not been in existence for the past 10 years, so that is of no concern. Um, in regards to transportation, we note that their comments are definitely um, something we should be looking into and within the future we do want to take on a transportation plan um, but that's not something we would be doing immediately um, and regarding the MI the highway access management and transportation plan the one has not yet been adopted by Manitoba infrastructure so until it's formally adopted by Manitoba infrastructure, the city will not be adopting it until they have adopted it. Um, and regarding this, that one map with the signalized intersection, it has been updated prior to being, after it was sent to the community regional planning, so it already, already has been updated. Thank you. Anything further? Nope. That's it. Any questions for Ms. Goodett? Sure, Councillor Spectrum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, based on the information that you provided, you're saying that uh, uh, you're the official, officially recommending that we move ahead with second reading of Correct. this. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to have any questions or, or uh, speak against uh, or have opposition to this uh, uh, bylaw? Seeing none. We will now adjourn that portion, and now we'll move to the city zoning bylaw. Bylaw 2011, Mr. Workentine, I'll ask you to introduce this, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, this uh, particular portion of the uh, public hearing relates to uh, City of Steinbeck Bylaw 2100, uh, which is uh, a review of the city's uh, zoning bylaw. Uh, the uh, purpose of Bylaw 2100, uh, the general intent is to regulate the use of buildings, structures and land to regulate location, height, bulk, size of yards, courts, and other open spaces, to divide the city into land use zones such as uh, number, shape, and area, 
as may be in keeping to carry out provisions of the City of Steinbeck Official Community Plan. Uh, and finally, provide for the issuance of development permits and provide the procedure to obtain an amendment and the fees to be paid. Uh, public notices, uh, as required under the Planning Act, were issued. Uh, there are no written, uh, there is no written correspondence on file as far as objections, other than uh, the uh, letter that uh, was also submitted by Community and Regional Planning with respect to comments uh, to uh, City Bylaw 2100. Uh, with respect to uh, the zoning bylaw itself, uh, as was uh, mentioned uh, during the introduction of uh, bylaw 2099 for the official community plan, there has been public consultation uh, by way of open house uh, and uh, other opportunities for public input, input to be provided uh, during the review process. City Council has reviewed uh, the uh, draft bylaw on a number of occasions uh, with specific amendments being made at time of first reading. Uh, there is a summary of the uh, uh, of the overall changes that is provided uh, on page 22 of Council's information package, um, and uh, they, uh, there is a number of them. Uh, I'll uh, I'll identify um, a few of them. Uh, however, if there are further questions from Council, I'd be happy to uh, to provide uh, further uh, responses. Um, Section 59.1, uh, again, Development Reserve 2 has been added within the city zoning bylaw to uh, also reflect and mirror the changes that uh, were presented in the official community plan document. Uh, changes in the uh, use table uh, that is uh, provided in Table 3-1 uh, includes uh, particular uh, uses for single-family dwellings. Uh, secondary suites not permitted uh, in DR1 and DR2 being Development Reserve 1 and Development Reserve 2. Uh, daycare centres uh, will be added in the RSF residential single family zone as a conditional use. Um, other uses such as campgrounds, racetracks, outdoor sports, etc. Uh, will uh, be designated uh, as C in Development Reserve 1. Uh, the uh, city or administration has also recommended the addition of uh, dog park particular use uh, within public and institutional park and park related uses as a conditional use. Uh, there are particular uh, policies that have been added, uh, specifically 74.1 uh, to allow for the provision of keeping of animals. Um, a uh, particular uh, of particular attention to council has been section 134.4 related to the surfacing uh, of uh, required parking uh, for uh, for new development within the city um, there also has been adjustment to parking provisions in section 2 point or 216.4 and 226.3 in both the central business district and transitional uh, zones with respect to uh, uh, the provision of uh, uh, limited uh, opportunities for on-street parking. Uh, I'd also like to point out for City Council's attention uh, that an error was discovered in the uh, map that is attached at the rear of the document uh, which uh, gives a visual representation of the particular land use zones. Uh, this error was discovered since first reading and has been corrected and in particular this was land on First Street that is currently under consideration of under zoning bylaw 2092 as of now, it remains designated as RLD, Residential Low Density. Uh, with respect to uh, the uh, overall uh, document, uh, due to the uh, significant level of review, uh, both with the public, uh, with the city's uh, consultants, uh, and with council, administration recommends uh, that subject to any further information that may be provided at the hearing, uh, that city council give zoning bylaw 2100 second reading. Thank you, Mr. Workney. Just before we get to the public uh, hearing process, uh, I just want to clarify outdoor sports stadiums are not permitted in DR1. Is that correct? That was the... Did I misspeak? Uh, I believe I did. Not conditional use, but rather not permitted. That's correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Is there anyone here wishing to object or have any questions on this file? Go ahead. Please take the podium. Take your, we know your name and address now. You know it now. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Ms. Burgess. Uh, my first question is, you made, um, sorry, Mr. Workentine, I think just made a reference 
Was it to 59.2? Correction, is it the correction in the, the map? Is that yeah. what you're wondering no, about? No, 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 it was one of the first amendments. Uh, I believe it had to do with the uh, new districts. Uh, 59.1 in regards to the DR1, DR... Uh, DR 59.1? Okay. It, I thought uh, I heard 59.2, which doesn't exist. Okay. As this document is to become a legal binding bylaw, it needs to be accurate, clear, and transparent. What initially caught our attention was the change in color on the zoning map, which made it very difficult to distinguish the differences between certain zonings. That's when we caught the mistake with the zoning on First Street. The error was brought to the city's attention. That was corrected. We received a revised copy on Monday. And when I checked the website this morning, it did correctly reflect the designations. Uh, so just for anybody that was looking at these documents beforehand, just to clarify, that has been corrected. Thank you very much. When we caught the initial error, we asked ourselves, what else was missed? As the old saying goes, where there's smoke, there's fire. When we started looking at the document a little closer, we discovered the initial error was only the tip of the iceberg. Starting as early as the table of contents, illustrations, <coughs> illustration 12, site depth, should actually be illustration number 13, <coughs> illustration number 13, site types should be illustration number 14. The numbering is inconsistent throughout this document. The 2015 bylaw goes to section 6.2, with the last item being 206.1 on page 118. The current bylaw also goes to section 6.2, but, but number 228 on page 117, one page less, but 20 some odd numbers more. Each new section heading should start with a new number. Page 8, section 1.5, first item is 32.1, which is correct. The information in this section should then be numbered 32.2, 32.3, etc., not 32.33.1. Page 23, section 3.1, you start a new section with a number 63.4. In addition, your original bylaw, there was a preamble about the table. This looks like it inadvertently got deleted and then just added back on page 30. The numbering of sections, subsections, is inconsistent throughout the document. You're also missing a section. Page 47, what happened to section 107.2? You have incorrect references, table 4.1 dimensional standards, footnotes C, E, F, and the letter G. In all, <coughs> all of these have incorrect references. Example. In F, dimensional standards required for spaces with residential mobile home parks, see provision 105.1. Section 105.1 in this document is actually the section on shipping containers. I don't think I want to live in that residential mobile home park. Table 4.2, dimensional standards for accessory building, structure or use. Again, the footnote references are incorrect. Definitions and dimensional standards. To be clear and transparent, the bylaw needs to be objective, have clear definitions and quantifiable dimensional standards. A few examples, page 19, section 61.3, low rise fam multifamily units. Unless you define this quantitatively, it's too subjective. Page 20, section 62.2, relatively shallow lots. Again, very subjective. Page 52, table 4.1, maximum height of buildings for RMD, three stories, RHD, eight stories. Standard practices to define specifically the maximum height in feet or meters. Using Brandon as an example, it limits RMD to 14 meters, RHD to 43 meters, and defines specifically how the story is determined. Selkirk, Winnipeg bylaws, also measurements are specific. Yards, while the bylaw clearly demonstrates in illustration 15 what is a front side or rear yard, an info policy specifically says buildings must face the street, we are seeing time and time again buildings being built perpendicular resulting in the back side of the building actually facing the side yard, which according to the bylaw only needs four feet for RMD. By definition, backyards on RMD need to be a minimum of 25 feet. The reason, people need space. These smaller backyards are not healthy. The zoning bylaw needs to address this. The new buildings on Lowen Boulevard are a prime example of this. Table 3.1. Table use and zoning maps are inconsistent. 
According to Table 3.1, you cannot have a gas station in a residential single-family zone, yet the SO on Giesbrichten 52 is RLD, according to both the zoning map <coughs> and the Manitoba Assessment Branch. Places of worship are not allowed in residential single-family. There are at least two that violate this. Places of worship in a district M, in an M1 district have a asterisk C conditional use restriction referencing section 79.1, which limits places of worship with gross floor area of more than 40,000 square feet to C3, C4, and E1. There is at least one that violates this zoning. How many more inconsistencies are there of this nature, and what are the tax implications? Are we charging too much based on the Manitoba Assessment Branch Bowl zoning, or are we not charging enough? When it comes to green space, there are some pocket, pocket parks that are reflected and others that are not. Other issues and concerns. Section 41.1, damage to non-conforming structures. The change from <coughs> termination of right to maintain has been changed from damage exceeding 100% to damage exceeding 50% of the assessed value. Does this mean that a person with a non-conforming structure could lose their right to replace their home if damage exceeds 50% of the assessed value? If they can't replace their home, will this put them in a position that they will also not be able to collect insurance? How many non-conforming residential structures could this affect? Referring to the previous comments, if there was damage to the gas station or the churches that exceeded 50% given their non-conforming, what happens to them? Section 56. Point one, remedies and penalties. These are weak and only encourage non-compliance. It is easier for a developer or a builder to pay the fine than ask permission. Example, a developer signs a development agreement. He says he's going to build eight foot walls, but builds nine foot walls, or builds too close to the property line. He can simply pay the fine, which is minimum fine of $100 for an individual, or 500 for a corporation. On a multi-million dollar project, this is minimal and laughable. Are these penalties even being assessed? Are these items of non-compliance even being caught? Case in point, Snap Fitness has no landscaping or buffering behind its building. Per section 170.2, they should have not been able to get an occupancy permit, yet they've been operating for a while. I could carry on. However, I would like to give others the opportunity to speak. In summary, our point here is there are far too many significant errors and omissions and inconsistencies for this document to be given second reading. It should be sent back for more thorough review before second public hearing, not during a holiday season, at which time the next council can weigh in and sign off on the laws they will need to enforce. This bylaw is only due for renewal in 2020, so there is ample time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Please take the podium, state your name and address. I will get uh, administration to, uh, to uh, re reference some of the points that you made, not all of them. Because My name is Maria Gay. I'm on 8 Fernwood Bay, uh, box 1313, different address. Uh, from everything I've been hearing, whether it's been from concerned citizens, business people, agricultural people, provincial people, Everybody else, it seems like, are we rushing this too quickly, or is there some more work that should be done, things that should be looked at? Uh, I mean, Mr. Siemens there spoke on the work that the previous councils have done and, and about the beautification on Main Street, but I don't know if anyone has looked lately by shoppers at somebody's vacant property which has weeds this high, where is somebody checking out the bylaws? I also notice we have a new car dealership, I think, on Main Street because there's a lot which has vehicles on it, which has no sign who's doing it, but I guess it's a private whatever. So is any of this being checked out either? Are we making amendments and bylaws and nobody's carrying them out or checking out on some of these things? And I just say, you guys need a lot of wisdom and think on this. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Yeah, please take the podium, state your name and address. Lisa Martins, 42 Edgewood Street. Okay. Um, mine's in regards to uh, home daycares. Um, I'm glad you changed the bylaw to eight children versus seven, which was before, or looking at it. 
Um, it helps me right now, but for future expansion, um, it makes it harder. It would be nice to see you make it where it matches the Manitoba regulations, which is eight children for a family home daycare and 12 children for a group family home daycare. Um, my question is, what are the concerns with following the provincial guidelines? Thank you. Anyone, uh, we will get these answered by administration shortly. Uh, anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Yeah, okay, please take the name, your, your, please state your name and your address. Okay, my name is Alice Boychuk. I live at 93 First Street with my husband Clifford. When my husband and I moved to Steinbeck on First Street in 2004, we moved to retire on a quiet, quiet street in our residential area. Since the, since the uh, second half of Giesberg Street was being constructed to Mackenzie, our street happens to be busier almost, with almost uh, 60 to 70 or 80 cars a day. Not, uh, and not finding out that perplexes wanted to be built on First Street on the residential area, we are very, we are going to be overpopulated with vehicles and the value of our homes will drop in prices increasingly. My husband and I don't have, uh, don't have any intentions of moving as we bought this house to retire in, in a very quiet, private area. This is where we intend to retire. It will also take away our privacy, a way where people will be watching uh, every move that we make and we'll be, we will be afraid to leave our homes for a few hours or a day or even longer if needed. When I say we will be, we will lose our privacy, two years ago when the West 20 condominium was built behind my house. I was in my backyard and a mosquito bit me on my thigh and a lady on the balcony on the second floor says to me, I can see you scratching. Is this what we want? Is this the kind what we want these purposes to be built that people would be watching over you, what you're doing, where you're going, where you're scratching? This is, I think this is something that the city should look into. We're losing our privacy. We never had this problem before any of this was going on. We could scratch in our yard, nobody was watching us, nobody saw what was happening. So I thought, I'm gonna go look at those condominiums and see, so I went on the balcony, and it just happened to be right over my yard, and I could see everything, what my husband was doing, if there was a weed in the yard, if there was a bird in the yard, I could see everything. This is not what the people of First Street want. At least I don't. And I don't want any condiment or any purposes built near my house. That is my privacy. I don't want people looking over my fence where 85, uh, the house 85 used to be. I understand that there's supposed to be a perplex might be built there. That is not our intentions of our retirement. Um, I'm just about losing more I was here because I wrote in writing. And uh, to the mayor and councillors, how do we know what kind of people will move into those purposes that we can trust and not be afraid of them at night or they, that they might go prowling around our home at night. Remember, we do have some elderly seniors and some live alone. Does that mean that they will have to move to because of the perplex or because of Royal LePage's perplex to make money on selling that, uh, so they, that they can rent the perplexes out, the rooms? All that these houses need on, for, on First Street is a little bit of tender, loving care. They need a few boards, a little bit of paint, inside and out, and a few nails. 
And people that can't afford will be more than happy to live in those homes if these people that are living there don't want to live there. Um, I, uh, I sincerely suggest that Council and the Mayor think about how the residents on First Street will feel about this. Thank you, Alice Boychuk. Very good, thank you. Anyone else here wishing to object or have any questions on this file? This is on specifically the zoning bylaw, the greater zoning bylaw, not specifically what's happening on First Street. Is that correct? Oh, may I? Am I too late? You, you've already had your spot. Okay. But uh, you, you have something specific in regards to changes uh, to the zoning bylaw in general? No? Okay. You can't, like, again, you can speak, uh, you, you can follow through, but this is specifically a public hearing in regards to the zoning bylaw in general, not specifically the changes that were, that were approved on First Street uh, a number of months back, just being clear, okay? I, I, can, still, I can still give you time to speak, but uh, just so you know what, what this hearing is about. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions on the zoning bylaw? Okay, one further, one further question, Ms. Boychuk, and then, uh, yeah. and then we'll have Ms. Goodett uh, respond to a few of the concerns. What I forgot to mention is we don't have a speed limit on First Street. That is the number one. Our street is so busy. I have never seen so many cars. We're just uh, like Portage Avenue. And the speed limit, the people that they drive, they drive 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. If somebody was to cross the street, an older person or a little kid, they would kill them for sure. I mean, the city has to look into this, the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. One very quick, One very quick question, then Ms. Goodett will, uh, will uh, uh, respond to a few of these, and then we'll move forward. Go ahead. Um, the zoning bylaw with respect to um, maintaining the um, lots that are conforming or not conforming, is part of the bylaw and is relevant to the residents on First Street because trying to uh, change any of that, it's happening in their neighborhood. So the zoning bylaw is relevant in particular to the aspect of um, enforcing the bylaw. Thank you. Ms. Godet, uh, I'll ask you to take the podium or Mr. Warkentine, whoever chooses. Now, Mr. Warkening, there were a number of, uh, of points that were uh, raised. Uh, some of them had to do with uh, some generality or some very specifics in regards to numbering and so on. Uh, and then some were more general. Uh, I'll give you a chance to, uh, to discuss a few that you so choose, and then we'll go from there. Uh, yes, and uh, I think my list will be very brief. I wasn't able to catch all of the uh, reference that, references that were provided. Uh, however, with respect to uh, some of them in particular, um, I do understand uh, the, uh, the concerns of uh, Ms. Burgess to be ones of uh, um, references within the zoning bylaw. Um, there has been uh, a number of uh, sections renumbered due to the revisions that, uh, that have been worked on. Uh, generally, I can refer to it as the policies themselves uh, have not been amended, uh, but it appears to be that there are errors with referencing uh, sections that may be applicable. Uh, and until I've had a chance to uh, review those specifically, uh, that uh, I, I'm, I'm not able to provide any further right. comment. Right, there are a lot of that. very specific details there, yeah. Uh, they are, and uh, you know, insofar as, uh, as uh, uh, particular errors, uh, whether they be grammar uh, or references to policies within the document. Uh, this is something that uh, has happened before uh, during reviews, uh, but uh, I can uh, give assurances to uh, Council uh, that, uh, that those reference errors will, uh, will be identified as best as we are able and corrected. Um, insofar as uh, the uh, the comments also made by Ms. Burgess with respect to uh, land uses, for example, places of wor worship are not permitted uses in the RLD, RLD zone, which is residential low density. Uh, that is in fact correct. Uh, however, the churches uh, may have been in existence for many years uh, with the particular zoning category and the reference that she provided uh, being changed after the fact. Uh, 
uh, in that case because the church was a prior use before the zoning category was changed those uses again are permitted to continue uh, that would be uh, uh, an obvious explanation uh, but uh, insofar as uh, new structures for places of worship in that particular zone uh, I can confirm that the city would not permit that development to uh, to proceed um, and then finally reference to section 41.1 with respect to non-conforming structures, uh, if uh, damaged greater than 50%, uh, would not be allowed to, uh, to uh, be rebuilt. Uh, that uh, particular statement mirrors exactly the Planning Act, and that is just reflected in the city's zoning bylaw. If there are other questions, I uh, could try to answer them. Uh, specific in regards to home daycares, uh, that was brought up, and in, yeah. in regards to the number of eight rather than 12, as, as was referred to was the provincial standard. Any comments in regards to that? Uh, with respect to provincial standards, uh, again, the, uh, the city's uh, policies within the zoning bylaw generally attempt to mirror the, uh, uh, the requirements within the provincial uh, requirements for daycare. Uh, we have uh, identified uh, eight or fewer children uh, with respect to the basic level of daycare provision uh, in that that can be provided by the individual homeowner on their own. Our understanding is uh, any number of children in a daycare uh, greater than eight requires uh, an additional employee or a second uh, supervision or supervising adult or responsible person. Uh, and as such, because it does involve uh, the addition uh, of an employee to uh, a, an operation, uh, it's viewed as a different category within the city's zoning bylaw. Uh, it still is a permitted use in uh, many of the residential zones, uh, but I believe, uh, going on memory, those are conditional use applications. Very good. Thank you. Uh, anything else that uh, that need to cover off specifically, or that you I know there are a lot of some small details. I guess I have a question for you, Mr. Workentine, and that is the, the minor details when it comes to the uh, numbering and making sure the numbering is correct and some of it d may need to be adjusted, uh, although you'll have clarification on that. Uh, can that happen after second reading? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, the, uh, the issue of numbering, uh, it uh, doesn't reflect a change in policy. Uh, it is, uh, in, in my uh, opinion, is uh, similar to a spelling mistake or a grammar correction. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions from uh, Council to Administration? Thank you. Mr. Walker, uh, I know you did also provide us with information. Did you have anything to add today? Um, with regards to section 30.1 of the zoning bylaw, uh, this is with regards to minor variances. The Planning Act has recently been updated to allow for 15% uh, to be delegated to administration, should the council wish to. Uh, your current zoning bylaw or your proposed zoning bylaw says it's at 10%. So um, I raise that for your consideration. Um, development Reserve 1. Um, for further clarification, um, we feel that this section should state that for future development within the DR1 zoning district, a zoning bylaw amendment will be required to rezone the lands and an appropriate zone, uh, to an appropriate zone following an amendment to your official community plan. Um, for Development Reserve 2, again, we recommend that uh, Development Reserve 2 be renamed to Agricultural Zone, a similar recommendation that we made for your official community plan, to better reflect the existing and intended uses of this land. Uh, for the Shipping Containers, Section 105.1, um, we would recommend that you consider placing a limit on the number of shipping containers permitted in the zoning districts where they are permitted. Uh, with regards to the use table 3.1, um, agricultural cultivation and agricultural grazing should be listed as permitted uses in the Development Reserve 1 zone to reflect current land uses. Um, uh, we also recommend that uh, Council consider uh, creating a separate table called an accessory use table. Uh, currently you have uh, accessory uses that are in your one existing use table and for clarity, it helps to have a principal use table and an accessory use table. 
those were the major ones that I wanted to highlight. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Goodett, uh, I'll ask you to take the podium uh, just to address uh, those few uh, highlighted uh, points. Okay. In regards to uh, the variance order, the minor variance, we have made that change um, following what we, when we submitted it to the province. Once we received the final bill updated uh, planning act with Bill 19, so we have updated that already within the, the that was bylaw. Just a few weeks ago that that change yeah. took place. That correct? Correct. Um, Sorry. Um, in terms of metal shipping containers, the policies we have in the zoning bylaw state that if a shipping container is on the property longer than 90 days, we view it as a permanent structure and as such, the uh, accessory use requirements would be subject to those shipping containers. So we do have, there will be a limit depending on the zone. There is a limit for the amount of square footage you can have for accessory use. So any shipping containers are <coughs> considered as part of that. Um, and I think that was, uh, that was pretty much it. The other small changes that they have suggested that yet yeah, we agree and we will certainly make those minor changes before we submit it for review. Thank you. Very good. Any questions for Ms. Goodett? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right. Anyone else wishing to object or have any questions? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and I will turn this back over to Council. Council, how would you like to proceed? First of all, with official community plan, bylaw 2099, Council Swagstra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, I will move second reading of the official community plan. Thank you. Seconder? Councillor Penner, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just, we've had a, a long hearing here, and so I just want to make sure that I make it clear that the comments are specifically in regards to the official community plan as opposed to the zoning. That's a separate one that we'll deal with in a few minutes. Uh, I just want to thank everyone, you know, through you, for, for coming out. This has, uh, frankly, been the most interesting public hearing we've had on one of our planning documents. We've had people from the community uh, and the planning department here to, uh, to provide comments and raise questions. And uh, so I just want to address a few things as I go along here. As has been noted, the official community plan sets out the uh, general direction for the city over the next five years. It's specifically a five-year planning document. Uh, it was last updated five years ago, uh, or, sorry, three years ago in 2015. And uh, we are creating this new one early because of the significant change in regards to the new lands that have been uh, annexed within the city of Steinbeck. And just, just to be clear, the uh, official community plan is almost identical to the one that was approved by the province in 2015. And uh, the specific changes are almost entirely limited to the new areas that have been added to within Stymex. So the development reserve one and development reserve two, and then updating the maps accordingly. So everything is obviously open for discussion, of course, because it's a new official community plan. Uh, but it should be noted that, uh, uh, that this entire community plan, with the exception of these updates, was officially approved by the province after an extensive consultation uh, and, uh, and went through that process. Um, just in regards to uh, some of the things that, that have been raised, uh, I appreciated the, uh, uh, the questions from, uh, from Mr. Reimer in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of his mixed farm and uh, the questions about development reserve two. We've had a lot of discussions in council. This has not been a rushed process. This is a pro process we started last year when we knew the annexation was happening. So this has been underway for many months. And uh, certainly the questions that he'd raised, you know, in regards to development reserve two, uh, centered around will we permit agriculture to continue? And absolutely, that has been uh, the focus of a lot of discussions of council, all at open meetings where we have discussed, and it's been well reported, that we've questioned extensively about making sure that anyone who has existing agriculture within the development reserve areas will be permitted to continue. So everything uh, that uh, uh, the farmers are doing within development reserve two will they will be able to continue to do so as long as they wish to continue farming. Uh, and that is certainly something that's been, uh, that's been made very clear. Um, the, uh, some good points that were made by Mr. Reimer with regards to uh, uh, infill development needing to build up and not out, that is, uh, that is true, that has been a focus. We need to balance that with the fact that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that we have to respect what people's wishes are within neighborhoods. And uh, actually a prime example is that we have people here at this hearing who have sometimes objected to previous uh, increased density within infill areas. So we have to balance you know, existing neighborhoods and the fact that a lot of people still want to live in single family homes, as I do myself and so do many others, 
We're not taking that away. So we, we encourage uh, the increased infill, but we can't, we're not going to mandate that everyone must, uh, uh, must change in that regard. Uh, Ms. Burgess had raised some, uh, some questions, and obviously I'm not going to address every single one. Uh, uh, she had raised more questions in regards to the, the zoning in terms of some of the details there, but that's a different topic. Um, specifically, the big one is this issue of, do we need to a delay approval of this until after the election? That's the primary concern that she had raised. Uh, and my answer to that is that the council that is elected is the council that is set up to, you know, to deal with questions before us. Um, again, this is not like this is not something that we started last week and now we're quickly rushing before an election. This is something that started last year when the annexation was already approved. If we were to say that this is not going ahead until after the election, we put the whole thing on hold and then to have to restart everything that could be easily be another year before anything has changed in this regard. And we need to have some clarity, especially with some of the questions that have been raised, we need to make sure that the areas that have been annexed within Steinmaker are properly designated. And so some of the other questions and, uh, that she had raised in regards to, and I, in terms of you know, car dealerships being downtown, should that be replaced with an auto, uh, auto mall, what about the feed mill? We have to recognize that the city has changed over the years and that there were many, many, many businesses and homes and other properties that had uses that long predate every zoning bylaw that we currently have and you certainly long predate many versions of this official community plan and that these changes are made here to reflect future direction and the reality is is that we have many existing non-conforming that operate within this so you will find within the existing borders of the city of Steinbeck you will find uh, many examples of exceptions and uh, and that's just simply the reality that is simply how, uh, how the planning works here but specifically in regards to the official community plan Plan and the questions that, uh, that have been raised. And uh, I know that there were some questions raised by community planning, which our staff did answer. Uh, again, going back to the fact that the vast majority of this plan was, ad was adopted only three years ago, fully approved by the province. The only changes we're making in regards to this are specifically in regards to making sure that we designate the lands properly uh, for the areas of animals within the city of Steinbeck. And so, therefore, I think we can, uh, we can move ahead with second reading. Thank you. Councilor Penner. Nothing further. Anything further from Council? Councillor Fair. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I, there's just one thing I'd like to point out. I think, I think that uh, we've all been new on Council at some point, and to, uh, I think in regards to uh, waiting for the next Council to come along, and, and uh, you know, many of them, there, there might be four new people here, there might be more. We don't know that. And so I think that to get a new Council, I think nobody would argue the fact that the first six months to a year, you're probably not going to be on your best game because you don't know everything and so I think that there's probably nobody better qualified to do this than we are right now so I think that uh, I, I would like to see this uh, happen uh, before the new council comes in. Thank you. Further discussion? Anything in closing? No. no. All right council obviously uh, you've been working on this for quite some time uh, we have uh, had many a meeting we've had some open houses we've had uh, our uh, consultants come in who are experts at planning looking at this and uh, obviously our staff has put a, have put extensive amounts of work in. Uh, these documents are evolving. Uh, they evolve over time. Every five years we change them. This one happens to be a little bit early because of the, uh, the friendly annexation that we did have with our neighbours. Uh, the reality is, is that we want to make, uh, make things clear for those who are living in those areas. We want to make sure that farm, farmers who are farming those lands understand uh, that they can continue to do that and that uh, we want to continue to uh, work in a constructive, well thought out way. And so as we move forward, this is going to be a good guiding, guiding document that will again be evolving and changing over the next number of years as new councils look at it and there's new ideas and new changes that happen in our city. So look forward to uh, giving this second reading. All those in favour of second reading? Carried. Council, this will now be moved to, to the minister's office where they will look at this and, uh, yeah, and uh, send it back once they have reviewed it. Thank you. We'll now move to the zoning bylaw 2100. This was also just discussed. Council, how would you like to proceed? Council Fair? Yeah, I'll move, uh, second reading. move second reading. Thank you. Second by Councillor Siemens. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, further to uh, what we've uh, already talked about, the OCP, this is, our zoning bylaws have been in a work in progress for the last uh, probably eight months or ten months, and uh, is it a perfect document? Um, nothing, I don't think there's any perfect documents, but 
I think that we've tried to address these things and as things have come up, come up over the uh, time that, that many of us have been here, we've addressed those things and uh, so I think that this is going to be a good document for us to guide us. Thank you. Councillor Siemens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, uh, in favour of uh, the zoning bylaw. Uh, as stated, there's a few issues that uh, I would like to address uh, down the road in it. One of the uh, areas of uh, concern that I have with it is our CBD, our, uh, our downtown core, where I think uh, we need to uh, review our parking requirements. Uh, recently, we've had uh, discussions uh, regarding uh, church wanting to locate downtown, and uh, we've had uh, parking issues around it, a lot of discussion around that uh, last meeting. I think uh, that's one area that needs to be uh, reviewed uh, once it... Uh, once this has gone through. In order uh, for us to now uh, review that parking uh, requirement and, uh, and, and make those changes now in, in advance, I think would uh, preclude the whole, uh, to stop the whole zoning bylaw. I think there's a lot of good things in this zoning bylaw. We spent a lot of uh, time and effort uh, putting into it through uh, city staff and uh, through various hearings. And so this also has been in the works for uh, well over a year, and uh, I think that we need to move it forward. We can also move and work with uh, amendments after the fact, and then we can re review the very uh, specific pieces uh, to this. And then my biggest concern is uh, the parking requirements of the downtown core. Okay. Thank you for the discussion. It's good to see Councillor Fair has been working on it from eight to ten months, and you've been a full year. <laughs> the point is that you've been looking at it for some time and, and uh, obviously there's a lot of work. Anything in closing? No. Uh, Council, obviously this is a work in progress and there, your uh, Councilor Seamus is exact, 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 exactly right. There are pieces of this that uh, we will continue to look at closely when it comes to parking, when it comes to other aspects. Uh, there are so many different pieces to this zoning bylaw, and obviously administration will look at some of the details of numbering as well uh, before we give third reading. But I think it's important that we move forward with second reading. All those in favor of second reading. Carried. Council, now this will wait until the official community plan does come back from the minister, and we'll proceed. All right, we'll now move to reports and recommendations from the city manager and 8A, we have Cottonwood Drive Pathway. Mr. Workentine, this is something that we referred back to you and you have given us uh, uh, something written here. Uh, is there something, uh, would you like to just review this uh, briefly uh, with us, please? Sure. Um, my report, uh, as you mentioned, is, uh, was provided to, uh, to council members uh, late this afternoon. Uh, but uh, in general, um, the, uh, the issue of uh, what is happening on Cottonwood Bend was brought uh, to the attention of the city uh, on May 29th, 2018, uh, and uh, council passed a subsequent resolution June 5th. Uh, with respect to uh, a request by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Paul and Margaret Friesen uh, for the city to remove the sidewalk that is in a, now currently present on the public reserve uh, in between Mackenzie Avenue and uh, Cottonwood Bend. Uh, a further petition was also received dated July 10th, which is in uh, the current uh, council agenda package, uh, and uh, this is also requesting that the city close the sidewalk. Um, I guess, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there uh, was a, a previous uh, set of incidents uh, similar to what was described by the Friesens uh, in their current letter uh, back in 2004, uh, where uh, a group represented uh, by Mr. Friesen and others in the neighborhood uh, did request the city's uh, assistance in uh, resolving uh, an issue with uh, young people uh, carrying on similar in the manner as was described uh, in the more recent letter. Uh, at that time, there was uh, a referral of the matter to the uh, RCMP. Uh, the, uh, city, uh, the RCMP, uh, in conjunction with the SRSS uh, staff and students, uh, worked on uh, a resolution process uh, to uh, address the uh, concerns of the neighborhood. And uh, my understanding of, uh, of that review and uh, re review process did resolve the matter to the satisfaction of the neighborhood. Uh, as a further measure, and at the request of the Friesens, uh, City Council at that time also uh, approved the sale of uh, a large portion of that public reserve beside the current sidewalk 
uh, to the Friesens to act as a further buffer. Uh, and uh, that is now land that is used as the Friesens' backyard. Um, with respect to the uh, request to close the sidewalk or remove the sidewalk, uh, there uh, is a uh, piece of uh, underground infrastructure that the city uh, does have installed under that sidewalk on that public reserve for uh, storm sewer, uh, which uh, does provide essential drainage for the neighborhood. Uh, that uh, storm sewer has been present since 1991, uh, and the sidewalk present since 1992. Um, use of the public reserve as a public walkway, uh, if the uh, sidewalk was, uh, was removed, um, would likely uh, continue. Uh, however, that would result in uh, a reduced level of service uh, and uh, an increased risk uh, as the public would be using an undeveloped uh, pathway. Uh, neither the removal of the sidewalk nor the closure, uh, removal of the uh, uh, infrastructure or the closure of the sidewalk is recommended. Um, there also was a uh, recommendation from City Council to uh, inquire of both the RCMP and the Hanover School Division uh, as to uh, uh, any options that, uh, that they could provide. Uh, there were a number of uh, uh, options or uh, possible options presented by, uh, by both organizations. I've listed uh, a, number of their, a number of them in that report. Um, There was a recommendation or at least some options uh, provided by SRSS staff uh, for uh, additional monitoring, uh, both by staff uh, and uh, existing security cameras that uh, could be considered for the area. Uh, there was a discussion with uh, uh, our group to uh, apply crime prevention through environmental design principles. Um, while those uh, principles uh, can uh, be very helpful when designing new facilities, when you have built infrastructure and uh, development that is already completed, it uh, makes it very difficult to, uh, to try and modify uh, the, uh, the configuration or applications. So it uh, uh, would be difficult to, uh, to implement those. Uh, another suggestion was uh, a uh, relationship building process between both the SRSS as an organization and school uh, and the, uh, the neighborhood uh, and uh, investigate joint efforts between uh, uh, the groups as to how to foster positive relationships. As provided uh, in the solution uh, in 2004, uh, that seems to be uh, a method that, uh, that had success uh, in the past. Uh, further, there's also the opportunity for additional RCMP monitoring. Uh, that is both uh, on periodic patrols of the neighborhood uh, and also with the expectation that if there are uh, suspicions of criminal activity uh, by residents of the neighborhood uh, pertaining to trespassing, vandalism, uh, or other matters, uh, by all means they are uh, encouraged to dial 911 to, uh, to have assistance of the RCMP. Uh, finally, uh, one other consideration that uh, uh, was looked at was uh, whether to uh, uh, set up restricted parking on the Cottonwood Bend or Cottonwood Drive area, neighborhood which may reduce the daytime non-resident parking volume. Um, while there aren't any particular uh, options that uh, were suggested as, uh, as better, uh, it is uh, observed that uh, with the previous similar occurrence having uh, happened in the neighborhood, the strategies employed to resolve the issue at that time were proven to be effective and conclusive. Uh, my recommendation is that similar strategies be employed uh, at the current time uh, and coordinated between the SRSS, its students, the neighborhood, and when required, the RCMP to uh, address the concerns. Thank you. Council, any questions for administration? How would Council like to proceed? Councillor Siemens. Uh, through you to administration. How, uh, how many incidents have uh, occurred at that site? Did you get a report from the RCMP? Uh, not specific, but my understanding, it was uh, approximately a dozen over a five-year period. The discussions of the Hanover School Division, did that, uh, besides any of this, uh, or what you have reported here, is that, uh, did they have any conclusive uh, information as to what potentially could change that situation? Uh, it, uh, not conclusively, uh, they uh, did advise that they are in a challenging situation because uh, the 
control uh, of students when they are not on school property. My understanding is that uh, they do have uh, different rules that they must follow. Um, and uh, as far as specifics that uh, the, uh, the SRSS or Hanover School Division would be in a better position to answer that specifically. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I'm struggling with, uh, with the next steps here too. I think uh, as administration, as uh, I've spoken to the RCMP, I've spoken to a number of different people, I've spoken to the residents uh, in the area. Uh, I don't agree uh, that, that uh, removing that sidewalk would uh, solve any solution. There will still be a pathway there. We still have to leave it open for uh, the infrastructure that is underground there. And that's why the sidewalk was installed there in the first place. Uh, give easy access. I don't know what the offhand will, how uh, we solve this issue either. I think uh, RCMP monitoring is a, is a solution. One of the benefits uh, overall is that uh, students do rotate every four years. They theoretically, if, unless you take the five-year program like me, they, uh, they do rotate through and uh, but it's, it, there, there's new faces that I don't have a solution either. I've been working at this uh, for uh, two months. I don't want to take the sidewalk out. I don't want to recommend that. Uh, I would recommend that we work together with our crime prevention, uh, citizens on patrol. That would be an opportunity for, for them to uh, spend more time there, as well as uh, give this to our RCMP advisory committee. Uh, they could uh, put more effort in, as well as uh, additional monitoring. But. Uh, as this report, and this report was provided uh, through administration, so I don't have a firm uh, comment on what the next steps could be besides monitoring. Further comments? Councillor uh, Fair and then Councillor Funk. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that this has escalated to where we are today. I understand these problems have persisted for probably in the vicinity of 15 years, maybe, and uh, uh, I would nice to, it would be nice to have uh, um, a solution that would be uh, something that uh, would be uh, beneficial to the neighborhood. I, I, I can't imagine living there and, uh, you know, uh, having those conditions. I, I, I'm wondering uh, whether the, we have, when you, when you have uh, crossing guards at, at some of the schools, maybe it might be appropriate to, you know, for the school division to, I, I understand that this has been brought to their attention for many years already and it hasn't, still hasn't resolved. So I don't know what's going to change uh, because the phone 911, uh, and I've, I've also talked to some of the RCMP officers who are very frustrated with this as well. So uh, I'm, I, I would like to take a little bit more permanent uh, uh, step than, than, than this. Uh, I'm not so sure exactly what that would be. Uh, maybe a gate or something, I don't know. Councillor Funk. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have spent a lot of time on this, and we're really not that much closer to a solution on this. Uh, yeah, COPP, I think that would be a good idea. They could step up uh, drive-bys, they could walk through there. As the RCMP advisory, we did do a field trip, we did go look at it. We saw the uh, the damage to uh, Mr. Friesen's fence. There were no kids at the time. It was, uh, it was after hours, it was at 6.30 or 7 at night. There was nobody there. But uh, I do have a question for administration through you. In your, uh, Mr. Workington, in your opinion, would the uh, restricting the parking time on Cottonwood, would that alleviate anything? Or would that just cause more kids walking through there at regular uh, Restricting the parking to, say, two hours, uh, as is uh, the case in down, the city's downtown, for example. Um, it may require or cause uh, drivers of vehicles to move their vehicles more frequently. Um, it may not have any impact on what's happening there currently, because uh, if the individuals that are involved uh, aren't driving, there's no impact. Uh, it may have the unintended consequence of moving the issue elsewhere uh, if parking is not restricted, say, a block away. So there are risks. All right. Anything further? Councillor Swagster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, obviously a challenging situation, just a, just a couple comments. Uh, I 
in terms of the, the information that we have and what, we, what we've heard, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, closing the sidewalk, there is no guarantee that that would, uh, that that would uh, improve the situation, particularly since if we were to close it, even if we take the concrete out, it's still a, it's still a public pathway. It, is, it would just simply be an undeveloped public pathway, which actually makes it even more private and you have even a higher likelihood that that becomes a convenient hangout spot. So uh, I, this is one of those law, laws of unintended consequences, and I think that might be a consequence uh, unfortunately, and frankly, we're in the business of building sidewalks. We want more sidewalks, and uh, I would have concerns about removing uh, a pathway that is an access point for uh, for people, uh, not just in the neighborhood, but even but even beyond. And uh, uh, so, I, I have I would have some concerns about uh, about making that change. I do think that we need to continue to uh, be in communication with the RCP as we have been already, that obviously when there's criminal matters, those need to be addressed. And so we need to make sure that the, that, and I would encourage anyone who lives in that area, anytime there, a crime happens, it should be reported. Sometimes something happens and it seems relatively minor and we ignore it, we should always report it because then the RCP gets that on record. And so every time that a crime happens, it, sh it, it clearly uh, should be reported. I also like the idea of notifying uh, citizens on patrol and suggesting this as an area to additionally patrol because they do some good work there and they are able to spend more time in some areas than the RCMP on their regular patrols can. So I think that may be uh, one of the best things that I've heard uh, this evening in regards to uh, uh, getting continuing our partnership with COPP and specifically asking them, can you do some additional monitoring in this area, including during the daytime when school is in session. So, And I also think the dialogue with the school division needs to continue as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, Council, through consensus, uh, can we then look at uh, the following? And that is, number one, uh, remind people that they need to phone the RCMP if there's something that needs to be addressed. But number two is that uh, we uh, see clearly that uh, we, we send some correspondence to the Hanover School Division to continue to, to tell them we want to solve this and we want them to be a part of a, the solution to this. And uh, number three uh, is that we, uh, can't even read my own writing now, uh, that, that we involve citizens on patrol. I think uh, especially with coordination between RCMP, I think that's key. Uh, I think uh, Council Swagster, those are good recommendations and uh, it may not solve the problem uh, instantly, but I think it moves things in a direction that uh, uh, there are a number of, uh, number of organizations that can somehow address some of these issues and it's amazing how just a few people can take so much of our time and cause so much grief and it's really frustrating. So uh, through consensus are we comfortable moving in that direction? Thank you. All right we have accounts payable in the back of the book. You've had a chance to review those. Can I have someone uh, move approval of the accounts payable please? Councillor Penner, second by Councillor Funk. Any discussion? No discussion. Call for the question. All those in favor? Carried. We have bylaw 2101. This is Maplewood Street, first reading on page 33. You've all had a chance to review this. Mr. Workentine, can I ask you to briefly introduce this? Once I get there. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, is uh, a bylaw uh, 2101. Uh, for a proposed uh, rezoning uh, for uh, property located uh, uh, at a number of parcels uh, along Maplewood Street, 135 being the primary. Uh, the uh, the uh, proponent uh, is uh, seeking to uh, rezone the uh, subject parcels of land from RLD, residential low density, to RMD, residential medium density. Um, if uh, council feels that there is merit to the application, uh, the uh, recommendation from administration is that uh, bylaw 2101 be given first reading, uh, and uh, then a uh, public hearing would be scheduled to be heard uh, likely at the end of August. Thank you. Council, how would you like to proceed? Councillor Fair? First reading. Thank you. Second by Councillor Funk. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, simply uh, uh, a procedure for us to uh, uh, allow the uh, neighborhood to speak uh, to the situation. So, and uh, so I'd like to hear what they would have to say about it. Very good. Anything further? Through you, yes. Very, it's a very aggressive uh, uh, project, but I'd really like to see what the people would have to say to it. I think it could be very good for the area, and we definitely need to be. Uh, 
Thank you. Further discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor of first reading? Thank you. We'll now move to the building permits on page 47. You see a motion. I'm going to step out. I'm one of the properties on here. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Fair. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Call for the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Do we tell them to come back in? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have business licenses on page 49. You've had a chance to review those. Can I have someone approve those, please?